Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uni unique online talk, the sixth in a series of unique online talks that we've been doing since the beginning of the year. Today's topic is cultural relations and COVID-19. Uh, my name is Gitte Choch. I'm the director of UNIC, the EU National Institutes for Culture uh, Network. And I'm very happy to welcome so many of you today here in this debate. You're coming and joining in from all four corners of the world. And to get started, uh, we would like to launch a poll um, so that we can know where you're joining us from. So um, just indicate to us from which continent you're calling in today. We'll give it a couple of moments. Can we launch the poll? So let me be begin by explaining the outline of the meeting. Um, I'll give a couple of general remarks and then we have Roberto Velano, the UNIC president and director of, for cultural and language promotion in the Farnesina, the Farnesina, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs join us. We will then launch into a debate with eight panelists, um, very rich uh, panel that we have today. And around one o'clock, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. So how can you engage with us? There's a Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of this, um, of the Zoom interface, you can click open the Q&A and we will see questions. I will try to monitor this to the best of my ability and then also um, ask the panelists to answer questions. And if you have any technical questions, this is also the place to go. You can upvote questions there. Um, and you can also use the chat box, as I see uh, some of you are doing already, to introduce yourself and share, um, share further links or resources with us. Um, as we're really joining in from all over the world, we have created a glossary because it so happens sometimes that there's a bit of a Brussels slang that we uh, use a lot and that our panelists might use. So if you're unsure about terms, please refer to our glossary and uh, my colleague Roxanne will also share the link for that uh, with you in the chat box. Um, so let's look at the um, poll, um, if we can have the results. All right. I cannot see how many colleagues have voted, but 71% uh, are joining from the EU, by far uh, the most popular answer. But we also have colleagues from Asia. We have Europe outside of the EU. We have some colleagues in Latin America and North America. So those have been rising early. That's quite a feat. Uh, thank you very much. Let's look at the uh, speakers for today. We will look east and south uh, before zooming in on uh, Europe. We're um, having Natasha Ginwala as a panelist. Natasha is artistic director of the Columboscope Festival in Sri Lanka. We have Randa Hamid, uh, project coordinator for the EU UNIC project Sudan and Europe, Creative Connections. We have Lubov Kostova, a UNIC representative in Bulgaria and head of the British Council in Bulgaria. We have Ulf Hausbrand joining us from Ukraine. He is the representative or cluster president of UNIC in Ukraine and director of the Austrian Cultural Forum there. We have Sebastian Körber, deputy head of IFA, the Institute for External Cultural Relations based in Stuttgart in the south of Germany. And we have three colleagues joining us from the EU um, institutions. We have Henriette Geiger from the Directorate General um, of Development Cooperation. We have Tamas Süksch uh, from the Directorate General for um, Culture and Education, Youth and Sports. And we have Oliver Rentschler uh, from the European External Action Service. And of course, uh, Roberto Velano, the UNIC uh, president. So why are we here today? We want to hear from the ground how the 
um, current pandemic has affected cultural relations and the cultural sector in general. We want to learn about response pro programs already on the way. We want to reflect together how to strengthen advocacy for culture and cultural relations as we emerge from this crisis and are still battling it. Um, who are we? Unique is the network of um, EU cultural or cultural relations organizations. We have 36 members that engage in um, more than 19 countries uh, in the world in European cultural relations. Um, just one word maybe on our understanding of cultural relations. We understand it as a practice that brings people together to create a spirit of dialogue uh, and a spirit of mutual learning, co-creation and co-capacity building uh, with our partners in Europe and the, and the wider world. It's uh, a term that uh, we use just as well as the EU strategy or approach to strategy on international cultural relations uses it and you might hear it a number of times uh, in, this, in this webinar. All right, um, at this moment, I would like to uh, announce the next speaker, Roberto Velano, who is the president of UNIC, and he's joining us from Rome, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome. Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning from Rome. And thank you for joining this talk. Uh, today we are here because we want to highlight the importance of cultural relations, especially in times of crisis. We want to engage in a dialogue uh, about uh, how our sector has been uh, affected by the crisis and uh, how it is reacting. We want to highlight the positive signals of uh, resilience, uh, dynamism, new ideas, but also the problems, and the concerns for, for, the, for our future, um, and how we can move forward together in this uh, still uncertain situation. For that, I would like to bring to this uh, debate uh, not just uh, uh, nice words of introduction, but some concrete uh, figures uh, and, uh, and ideas. The first uh, element I would like to start from is uh, the survey we have conducted at the beginning of June um, among the 36 UNIC members about how this crisis uh, has affected uh, our work and the cultural sector in general. You can see the full results of this survey on our website, but let me point out four headlines from the survey. One, 85 of UNIC members temporarily closed uh, at least half of their branches worldwide. Cultural activities, language courses, exams were halted, postponed, or moved online. Two, most UNIC members fear a reduction in staff, funding, and a downsizing of their organization and activities. Almost half of UNIC members expect there will be fewer projects and activities in the future, and half of the members see a need to rethink their general strategy on cultural relations. Three, the crisis has pushed forward digitalization. A wide variety of digital content has been uh, created. Cultural activities, uh, uh, to continue cultural activities in the new conditions. New and especially hybrid formats for cultural relations have become more frequent. Three quarters of UNIC members digitalized their internal process during the crisis. And this, of course, raises a number of issues about access to internet, the lack of digital infrastructure, digital skills, um, copyrights, how to remunerate artists online, etc. Four, 80% of UNIC members see the need to forge more partnerships and to pool resources with other UNIC members. Overall, uh, I would say this survey shows uh, three major needs. 
invest in digital resources, increase advocacy about the importance of cultural relations, and three, reinforce bilateral and multilateral cooperation by supporting uh, local cultural sectors. And talking of cooperation, European institutions and most European governments have reacted to mitigate the impact of the crisis on, on the cultural sector. However, we are seeing among the consequences of uh, this crisis a certain tendency towards policies that are more and more national and inward looking. The second element I would like to, to bring to the beginning of this debate is the joint statement that was adopted by the UNIC uh, um, Assembly uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, in this statement, uh, um, under the title Make, Cultural, Make Culture Count in a Post-Crisis Global Society, <clears throat> we try to give answers to the question, what can cultural relations bring to, to the table to combat the effects of the crisis. The statement underlines the three major benefits of cultural relations, spirit of dialogue and solidarity, peaceful relations between the peoples of the world, and improving health and well-being of people. The statement also contains three um, important recommendations that we need a strong investment in culture and foreign policy, that we need a consistent and coordinated approach to cultural relations in Europe, and that includes all the different EU services, member states, unique members, as well as other actors to work together. And three, we need to support uh, our partners worldwide. In many, in many partner countries, uh, as we know, safety nets for cultural sector are weak. And today we want to listen to colleagues on the ground and discuss together how we can move forward. In this regard, and I conclude, I would like to remind that UNIC has an internal financial mechanism, which is called uh, the Cluster Fund, dedicated to support projects proposed by unique clusters on the ground and uh, this year we have gathered 300,000 euros which is very little compared to the effects of the crisis but at the same time it marks a steady increase compared to the cluster fund in previous years. This is of course part of a wider effort that includes also our leading program with the EU Commission, the European Houses of Culture I do hope that uh, we can continue together in this uh, effort to dedicate more resources and uh, join efforts to support cultural sectors on the ground, especially in partner countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Roberto. Let's uh, launch into today's topic. How has the crisis affected cultural relations and European cultural collaboration? What will this mean in the longer term? How can we strengthen advocacy culture together? And uh, we want to engage in a dialogue today about how the sector has been affected and how we can join efforts to move forward. The idea is to hear from the ground and then hear a response from the Brussels perspective. So we've uh, divided the eight panelists into two sections. So I'm now uh, welcoming um, the four first panelists into this room. Uh, we have Natasha Ginvala, the Artistic Director of the Interdisciplinary Arts Festival, Columboscope in Sri Lanka. UNIC uh, in Sri Lanka has partnered uh, with this festival for many years. And they've successfully submitted an application for European Spaces of Culture, the project that is aiming to bring EU cultural relations to the next level. Uh, Natasha is also the co-curator of the South Korean Gwangju Biennale in 2021 and has curated many other international arts events. Then we also welcome Randa Hamid from Sudan. Randa is the coordinator of Sudan Europe Creative Connections, a project between the EU and UNIC in, Su in Sudan. Randa has been a cultural manager at the Goethe Institute for the last six years and she's also the founder and director of the Sama Music Festival, um, a platform for young musicians and people working in the music industry to learn and exchange with the world. 
We also would like to invite Henriette Geiger. Henriette is the Director for People and Peace at the Directorate General for Development Cooperation here in Brussels at the European Commission. And Oliver Rentschler, Director of Public Diplomacy um, at the European External Action Service. Oliver is joining us uh, via phone. He can hear us and uh, we will be able to hear him when it's um, his turn. So Natasha, um, you're based in Sri Lanka. Can you tell us um, how the pandemic has affected the art scene in Sri Lanka and the wider region and what cultural relations partners from the EU can do in order to support the art scene? And maybe from your personal uh, point of view, what's, what can be the EU's added value um, in this? Thank you so much um, also for the, um, the opening address and your important questions. Uh, we from Sri Lanka and from the Columbus Folk team are extremely grateful for this opportunity as active partners of the uh, UNIC cluster in Sri Lanka and uh, also UNIC Global more recently uh, through the grant that we have received. Pandemics, um, as we know, don't only alter public health as biological threats, but they deeply alter societies. And we have been thinking very much of these alterations um, in micro levels uh, from this island where the Sri Lankan government has imposed curfew in several parts of the island uh, from the 18th of March and then continued uh, till the 11th of May 2020. Several artists have been um, located in different parts of the island separated from their families, separated importantly from arts resources as well. A um, lot of artists who are teachers um, and, and have second uh, professions in order to sustain their practice, uh, lost uh, considerable income. And um, it would be uh, very important to reflect on this aspect as well in reports of how local community cultural actors, when they lose their secondary jobs, because this is how they actually practice their, their, their art, um, because there is no real sustained funding from the government for contemporary experimental um, radical innovative practices. And that is where our festival is pitched. Um, and therefore, our collaborations with European partners are deeply crucial. Um, the fact is also that the island has already been through isolation uh, during the period of a civil war for over decades. So this immobilization, while it's not something new, it is something that is a very serious threat. Uh, for cultural practitioners uh, from here. Um, so we ask, uh, while travel across borders has cre uh, screeched to a halt in this early year, um, what can we do for emergency measures to sustain and enable diverse cultural networks um, as cross uh, for these measures and these, um, these offerings to actually cross borders in a meaningful way? Um, one has obviously been digitization, but we are also thinking about innovative formats uh, to continue collaborative productions with uh, European artists. Uh, and for this, uh, we're actually also using the current grant um, as a model to think about how local actors can deeply engage with the ideas and proposals that we have already received from artists in Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, Reunion Island, um, you know, from extremely vast geographies. So our role currently is to mediate between the proposals that we have received from community. Often it involves a whole lot of phone calls to artists who are uh, not uh, maybe as frequently using uh, internet to share their work. We have made digital commissions. We have an online project that is called Held Apart Together, which is our first digital program. Um, and we invite you to watch that program online. We have been thinking about Edouard Glissant's words, one way ashore, a thousand channels, um, as a way to really think about plurality uh, from this island. Um, I'd also like to add that um, the kind of provisions that, uh, that are being made and that are necessary in the medium term, not only the short term, uh, we're very aware that these need to be used also against insular conditions of cultural life at a time of authoritarian nationalism. Um, and therefore, internationalism and exchange is a sort of oxygen uh, for the community 
that we welcome uh, from a grassroots premise um, and therefore which means that it does need to reach uh, younger practitioners, self-trained practitioners um, and therefore to um, also uh, move beyond uh, the, the lack of uh, state provisions which often go to traditional art, to archaeological sites um, and, and, and you know, therefore do not reach uh, some of the core group that we work with. Um, I'd also like to, um, I might be running short of time, uh, but just to mention about uh, digitization, we do feel that the physical encounter is crucial, especially for festival formats and multidisciplinary programming that we have embarked on in recent years. Um, we are thinking very much about questions of vulnerability, mourning, and the futures of intimacy from this part of the majoritarian world. Um, we're thinking also about um, how to use workshop models that are online and on site uh, in the same way. So certain guests are online, but we are also able to gather in uh, small circles with necessary uh, measures because the Sri Lankan government is very, very strict um, and there have been uh, policing of measures and regulations. Uh, so we are very careful. And at the same time, we do not want to stop activities because institutions can close their doors but our cultural network is open and it is vividly inclusive. Um, so you. lastly, okay, uh, just to share, we're also doing workshops, mentoring circles, uh, virtual studio visits, um, and all of these will be public to be seen. Um, we really hope that some of you can join us in Sri Lanka next year when our project comes to fruition. Thank you very much, um, Natasha. It's super interesting what you say about uh, digital formats that you've already tried out and uh, the commissions that you've uh, been doing and hybrid formats that might come out of this. At the same time, underlining the importance of physical encounters and calling exchange oxygen. Um, I see also that in the chat, uh, your colleagues have been sharing uh, the links uh, for more information on uh, the programs that you mentioned. Uh, let's move to uh, Sudan. Um, our colleague Randa, um, how has the pandemic affected the art scene in Sudan and what have cultural relations uh, just contributed to combating the crisis? Okay, thank you uh, everyone and good morning from Sudan, or good afternoon. Um, uh, there is no doubt the pandemic uh, has imposed uh, a, a new reality to our life and uh, whether we like it or not, and the way how we react to it makes a difference. So uh, people working in the culture scene, like creatives and artists, woke up one day and they just lost every source of income, uh, either through contracts or uh, educational institution or even uh, tourism. So this new reality uh, made them realize it's really important uh, for them to act uh, very fast and adapt to the new changes uh, that is happening uh, in our life. Uh, they also made them realize uh, it's really important uh, to become financially independent. Uh, since most of the uh, opportunities for cultural people are through funds and support, but it's really important now they think out of this uh, limitation and become themselves uh, independent by using uh, the new format of digital uh, production like YouTube and so on. Um, uh, and at the same time, one of their uh, realization, uh, they uh, know it's really important now uh, to become more connected and to have uh, more networking. Uh, activities and they have to work together. Um, mainly our, uh, you know, uh, sector in Sudan are disconnected somehow and people are uh, uh, struggling to work together or in a group so they can have uh, uh, a better cooperation. Um, also, uh, this new realization of, of the, uh, this new uh, reality um, make them uh, think very serious uh, to initiate a dialogue uh, with the government at this uh, level because um, there is no uh, any kind of impact assessment of the corona 
uh, happening on, on, a, on a feature level to see uh, who has affected and how big is the effect itself. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there is no any kind of uh, aid or support uh, package have been received to people working in the culture sector. And we can understand this uh, because Sudan, as we all know, is passing through a very special condition right now, politically and economically, uh, in an economic uh, you know, uh, front, not uh, only the corona. So the corona is on top of all that. So, uh, yeah, that's why it's really important to initiate this dialogue and see how uh, culture uh, can be uh, uh, not neglected, like uh, always, and uh, to be put in the priority of the uh, government. Um, uh, if I have to talk about the uh, EU partners, uh, uh, you know, uh, role in uh, supporting the art scene, uh, I, I am so positive that the, uh, the powerful presence of EU in Sudan, EU partner in Sudan, can influence a uh, drastic solution for all the cultural problems in Sudan. Um, so I guess by having a dedicated fund uh, for Sudan to invest more in uh, infrastructure like uh, building cultural centers uh, or uh, galleries, uh, museum, uh, because these are, or even equipment, uh, because these are one of the obstacles at the, you know, at the way of um, uh, people working in the culture or artists and creative. Uh, investing in um, also in institutions, supporting institutions, because this is a big gap uh, that a small institution or organization or even establishing new institution make the culture scene uh, more uh, more powerful. At the moment, if I have to give an example of uh, all the global or international funds uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, happening, Sudan uh, is not a fit for these, uh, you know, for these uh, funds because we don't have the experience, uh, you know, organization. They don't have the technical even professionalism to apply for such uh, uh, funds, which we, we find ourselves uh, disconnected or uh, left out when we have uh, to use these funds. Uh, of course, we have to continue through our existence as UNIT or other EU partners in Sudan, uh, uh, investing in continuous uh, training and capacity building program. Uh, and finally, I believe uh, EU partner can uh, use their influence and power uh, to um, support or influence the policy uh, formation and policy reform on the government level. Um, so yeah, this is uh, what I think about uh, what is happening right now in Sudan and the presence of the EU um, in, in, in Sudan. Thank you very much. Very good to be reminded that, of course, Corona is not the only uh, factor in creating um, or making things for the cultural um, sector difficult at the moment. And you called out for more capacity building and also underlining a role that European actors can play, play in influencing policy. Um, policy is the key word uh, for my next uh, panelist, Henriette. Um, DG DEFCO has long been a fervent advocate for cultural and development cooperation. What is the European Commission, particularly of course DEFCO, doing currently to bring, bring cultural relations forward in the pandemic, keeping in mind also the particular added value of cultural or of development co uh, cooperation? And what synergies are you seeking with other EU services and external networks in this? Well, Thank you very much, uh, Gitte, and uh, also thank you very much for the speakers before me, because they bring home a very important observation. I think this is the first time that we're really uh, impacted all together at the global level by the same problem. 
And this is such a powerful uh, message that uh, calls us to act together. So I just want to um, want to, to say that on the onset, and it really impresses me whenever I'm in a conference as this one, how similar the impact is no matter where you are, whether in Africa, Asia, Europe, especially um, in the cultural sector. I mean, we know what it has done to, uh, to the health and the socioeconomic uh, sectors. So, um, but especially in the cultural sector, this has created havoc. Um, and this has created havoc in the EU. Um, but of course, the EU still has mostly uh, some uh, social protection that uh, at least gives a minimum of uh, insurance and income to the artists, even though also here, like 100% of the engagements are cancelled and artists depend, they don't have a fixed job. So um, they depend entirely on this. So I think the culture sector and the creative industries are the ones that are may, may be the, the worst hit by the crisis, if I may say so. And um, what, um, what we have seen though is also quite some resilience and quite some interesting initiatives to, um, to react as the previous speakers already uh, exemplified. And that's not the only uh, examples we know. Um, but if I may, one thing that I saw globally is how central the role for culture has been in this crisis in terms of resilience building. I'm not talking about physical resilience, but mental resilience. I think the role of artists that brought spontaneously um, culture to people, be it through songs, through theater, on balconies, on the streets. Um, I saw, for example, some musicians uh, spontaneously giving a street concert in front of a nursing home. And then immediately others came around. This creates such an uplifting of the spirits and such a sense of solidarity, uh, which has no price. This has no price because everybody says that we are maybe the worst impact is the impact on mental health. We are facing an incredible mental health crisis. And there, the value of culture for, for improving the psychosocial well-being and bringing hope and uplifting the spirit is really priceless. So I just want to highlight that. Um, but then let me come to what we do as commission. You have seen maybe that the commission and especially DG DEFCO for Development Corporation, within days, we reoriented our corporation portfolio to see how it needs to be adjusted so we can continue our work during the COVID crisis. So we did three things. We adapted our existing actions we accelerated our administrative process and you will have those who have worked with the commission, you wouldn't believe the lightning speed at which things became possible. I myself have been in the business uh, for, for like 30 years and I couldn't believe how within days we got everything done that normally takes months or years. And I hope we can keep that speed to some extent, even if it breaks our back. And the third thing we did is we opened new specific windows of activity that were adapted to COVID. Um, we also did something um, this year. This is a thematic brief uh, on the cultural dimension of responding to the impact of COVID-19. 
And so we helped our colleagues in delegations to give them ideas how through um, our action on development cooperation, we can respond in the cultural field and using, also, using culture to respond to COVID, but also how can we reorient, and reorient what we do in the cultural field. Two examples of reorientation very quickly and one of a new window. So um, reorientation, you may have heard about uh, one of our programs called the Ethical Fashion Initi Initiative which connects artists, artisans on the ground with high fashion and lifestyle designers and con companies to create global value chains, to create decent jobs, and to bring forward local cultural tr traditions and skills. So of course, this immediately collapsed with the crisis, and now what to do? So, what we did is we reoriented it immediately to mask making. So more than 100,000 masks were produced, um, but not only normal masks. They were with um, the sanitary characteristics necessary, but they kept um, the special local designs, uh, some, some artistic um, uh, twist uh, to it. Uh, so they sold very well, it created employment and, um, and of course we worked together with the different ministries of health and counseling centers and this was a huge success. Second uh, example is our Silk Roads Heritage Corridors. Um, that's what we did uh, to try to use tourism and cultural sites and combine it with artists and, um, and uh, cultural um, activity, local cultural um, artisans to, um, to create jobs. And so of course- I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt at this point. Um, we are running a bit out of time. Okay, sorry. Um, then just, um, I will not go into further. Yeah, two more, two more, very shortly, um, um, one key thing we did is meet the neighbors. Uh, that was a digital platform showing for free films and documentaries. And we had hundreds of thousands of people logging in for free and using this digital platform for entertainment. But um, what are we doing together? First, um, we work very closely with External Action Service, uh, EAC, NIR, and um, uh, putting this all together, but also with our member states in a Team Europe approach. And I think culture is really best placed because we have extensive co experience in collaborating in partner countries through the EU NIC network and our delegations but we have to put this to the next level. And this is very important for our next financial framework. So we get good <coughs> added value in the cultural sector. And I just want to close with the unique statement on COVID. We have a united firepower of EU and member states of 2.9 billion in 2019 of investment in the cultural sector and 35,000 staff worldwide. This is a real firepower, so we just have to use it well. Over. Thank you. Sorry for being long. Thank you very much. Very interesting to hear about the um, diverse activities that have been launched and especially about this briefing that you sent out to delegations. It would be interesting also to hear what comes out of that. So. Uh, let's stay in touch. We move, actually speaking of EU delegations, now to Oliver, Oliver Rentschler at the European External Action Service. Um, on the 21st of May, the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development, the EU Foreign Policy Chief, uh, Josep Borrell, and Commissioner for Culture, Maria Gabriel, have issued a, st a joint statement. 
and they said that culture can play a key role in the aftermath of the current crisis. So what came after this statement? How does the EAS implement this key role of culture in the external action of the EU? And how do you see, how can we strengthen the role of culture in foreign policy at this very moment? Thanks a lot, Gitte, and thanks to uh, Unique colleagues for setting uh, this up. Uh, definitely a very, very useful uh, webinar also for our purposes and indeed uh, the, uh, let's say, perspective of cultural diplomacy within the wider range of EU external action. And just uh, at the outset, in order to fully assess and appreciate the role and also the potential for, for cultural diplomacy, I'd like to uh, give a bit of a wider perspective as we in the ES have analyzed uh, the, the global policy implications, so to speak, uh, of, this, of this crisis, because it gives you a sense of uh, what's at stake here, particularly uh, for, for Europe. I mean, unsettling as this pandemic has been at all levels, personal, uh, for the societies, uh, EU itself, but also globally, I think uh, there is there's a lot uh, of, of worrying trends, uh, not all of them new, but some of them or most of them uh, amplified uh, by uh, the pandemic. I mean, the socioeconomic uh, fragilities, uh, geopolitical confrontation, competition of systems, if so you want, uh, battle of narratives, uh, multilateralism that is questioned, uh, intolerance. Uh, nationalist reflexes, blame gaming, disinformation. Uh, you have seen all of that um, sort of gaining, gaining sometimes new conjuncture in the last weeks, uh, even also questioning any collaborative approaches. And if you know, and we all do know what Europe uh, stands for and is about, uh, we can see that a lot is at stake uh, if this is not, uh, let's say, uh, confronted also by us in an appropriate way. And uh, EU's role in the world in a certain way is, is at question our values, our principles. And as we develop um, answers uh, to this, um, of course, then they have to be in many ways very concrete, uh, the geoeconomic uh, dimension, the global health, uh, public good, and so on. But none of the replies um, will function if we don't also put, let's say, cultural uh, relations uh, at, at the heart of it all, because they are, if so you want, the essence of uh, everything that's at stake, what we are about, the openness, uh, the reaching out, the creating uh, understanding, uh, reconciling, uh, building bridges. So that is the motivation of, of the uh, statement that you have quoted. Um, and that I think is indeed, for those that haven't read it, a very reassuring uh, commitment by the high representative to, um, to cultural uh, relations in, in their various, uh, let's say, uh, forms and, and uh, with the various instruments. Resilience has been mentioned as one, and indeed I can only fully uh, echo what, what Henriette has just said, uh, the, the incredible value of culture at all levels, again, personal, societies, reassuring, and so on. So I'll not go deeper into that, but we'll have to maybe say, although that may at, at some point look a bit self-congratulatory, but uh, I think our uh, communication, the, the uh, joint communication about the cultural strategy with its main pillars has not only uh, shown its, its worth, but it's basically confirmed these days more than ever as, as uh, the kind of approach that we need, because supporting culture as an engine for sustainable social and economic development needed more than ever. Promoting culture and intercultural dialogue for peaceful intercommunity relations needed more than ever and uh, let's say cooperating on cultural heritage again in this uh, reassuring what are we about our identity again is is i think valid and um, therefore i think part of the answer to your question is uh, we need to stay the course we need to continue doing uh, what we have uh, been doing uh, and, and uh, continue and expand our cultural policy. And we have developed some patterns of cultural cooperation and models of projects that we can further develop in, in other areas of the world. I mean, the pilot projects of the Parliament, uh, European Houses for Cultures, uh, that, that is now being carried out by UNIC in a series of countries uh, could, can and should be replicated elsewhere and improved. It's always clear, and this is, this is of course, what this is also about, uh, that circumstances have changed. There is a new normal for some time to come, um, but yet we should have this ambition to, to work on, on what has uh, been tested and proven useful uh, as far as possible. I come to alternatives uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a second, but this uh, we should not forget we have assets and we should develop them further, and we're committed to do that, and in the same way, 
uh, the project of the EU Western Balkans cultural heritage, for example, cultural heritage route uh, carried uh, over through 2019 from, from the previous year can also be further developed in the Eastern neighborhood, for example, because again, cultural heritage remains a central item of our uh, policy in this respect from development to the preservation of memory tourism industry, one that's now particularly hit uh, creative industries, and we have heard about the, the, the challenges there. So I think um, we, we should not, so to speak, uh, completely rethink uh, our, our policy. We need to adapt it, but we should also stick to what has proven to be successful and try to expand it, commit to it. Uh, as, as I said in the beginning, we need to just simply make clear that this is not a time to invest less in culture, but rather more. Uh, but then, of course, we need to also develop alternative uh, ways to, culture, uh, to carry out our cultural activities. We have done so, webinars, streaming, uh, EU film festival uh, that we could completely implement in a streaming way coupling also with the DEFCO initiative uh, mentioned, meet the neighbors of the neighbors, uh, and uh, while some events had to be postponed or canceled, uh, it's also an opportunity to, to rethink and to, I mean, make a virtue of, of uh, necessity. I think in that respect, for example, something like virtual Erasmus, and we all are clear about the importance of education uh, in these times in particular, and Erasmus is, is, of course, a key pillar there, but then virtual Erasmus with its ability to bring in, let's say, wider audiences uh, more easily uh, uh, could also be an asset in times like these, um, investing in networks which, which uh, have proven to be precious, particularly now, uh, are things that we, we need to just develop uh, further. Uh, the digital aspects have been uh, mentioned, and I'm uh, just sort of reiterating um, what the High Representative has in the statement of 21st May already together with Commissioner Gabriel highlighted. There is um, a, a definite commitment to, uh, to invest, to look at how we can create further spaces, how we can invest uh, further. The, that was a statement of reaffirmation, which at the same time leads us to um, let's say, do two things as said. I mean, we continue uh, to invest in what we found was, was useful, but we also review, uh, see what new uh, avenues can be opened. And for that letter, and I come to an end with that, the webinar today is of such importance because it gives us, together with the survey, which also is an interesting read, not only in the analytical uh, elements, but also in the creativity that it shows when it comes to new ideas, uh, but also what we heard so far, what I hope we can still hear, helps us in, in reviewing, uh, because the communication is, I said it uh, proudly, so to speak, still valid, but it's also uh, a couple of years old, so there's a moment now uh, to, to rethink, improve on it, um, but um, the elements uh, are, are there. Thanks for that. That's Over. a great keyword to say, uh, rethink uh, the strategy on EU international cultural relations because next year there will be a five-year anniversary of that strategy. Um, thank you so much for the first set of panelists. We're lagging a teeny bit um, behind with time, so I'm going to speed up. Um, before we turn to the second set of panelists, um, we thought we would do a little bit of an EU quiz. And um, I'll ask my team to launch uh, the second poll for the service for this, for this webinar as we're changing panelists. So when is the next EU summit? I think if you're in Brussels, you know the answer very well. We've mentioned uh, cultural relations and the strategy for EU international cultural relations. Um, but when was it? When was cultural relations actually first mentioned as an objective in any policy paper of the EU? And there's also the parliament. Let's not forget about all the aspects of the EU. When was the first, who was the first president of the elected, elected um, parliament? Um, let's see. And at the same time, I'm happy to announce the second set of speakers. We have Sebastian Körber. Uh, Sebastian is the deputy head of IFA, the Institute for External Cultural Relations, one of the German members of UNIC. He's joining us from the headquarters in Stuttgart in the south of Germany. We have Lubov Kostova uh, from Bulgaria. She is a UNIC representative there and director of the British Council in Bulgaria. Uh, welcome Ulf Hausbrand, joining us from Kiev, Ukraine. He's the director of the Austrian Cultural Forum and UNIC president in Ukraine. And we have Tamar Suksh, 
um, the Director for Culture and Creativity at the DJ EAC, Director General for um, Culture. So now we're turn zooming in a bit on Europe um, and um, let's turn to Germany. Germany is currently holding the presidency of the Council of the European Union. In the program, Germany has mentioned that they plan to systematically implement the EU strategic approach to international cultural relations. Sebastian, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about this, what is planned? We've also heard about the International Cultural Relief Fund aimed at supporting cultural structures around the world. And maybe from your point of view also as one of the think tanks um, of cultural relations in Europe, what are the major policy issues in general and maybe specifically for IFA right now? Thank you, Gitte. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. As you know, Germany has taken over the EU presidency at really challenging times. First, its term will be crucial for agreeing as quickly as possible on a recovery fund. The cultural sector reels under the devastating effects of the pandemic, and it is, it is extremely important that culture is included explicitly in the rescue package. But of course, the recovery fund also has to be linked to the green and digital tr transitions. Second, the EU long-term budget, the multi-annual financial framework for the 21 to 27, has to be adopted by the end of the year. A joint letter by the German, French, and Italian ministers for, for culture has been sent to the Commission, stressing the need to increase funding for Creative Europe, which in the new budget proposal has been reduced. So far, at only 0.15% of the EU budget, the culture program does not reflect culture's importance to society. However, the Commission at this stage can only facilitate the dialogue. The ball is in the field of the member states. They are tasked to find an agreement, and it will be up to the German presidency to propose a more ambitious, ambitious budget for culture. It will need to convince um, the other EU leaders about the fact that culture is a key driver for recovery in Europe. Once again, culture risks being treated as a luxury, something nice to have, instead of a vital component of the recovery. Rather than being regarded, regarded as a cost, culture should be recognized as an investment, as uh, Oliver already put it before. But for Europe to recover from COVID, culture must be part of the solution. There are many other challenges like the Brexit agreement the, or the migration packages, which are both urgently needed, but certainly not easily reached. I already mentioned the Green Deal and the digi digital transition, not to forget the, the, the relations with China and Turkey and the question if Europe is able to speak with one voice. Last but not least, the US presidential elections in November. If you ask me what are the major policy issues for IFA and its research program, I would say first, culture and the social development goals. In Europe and across the world, the cultural sector has really been severely hit by the pandemic. Fully 95% of the countries closed or partially closed their museums, theaters, concert halls, cinemas, monuments. Many cultural institutions cannot sustain the losses and risk going under. As so often, the poorest and most vulnerable are hit hardest, as already Henrietta put it, and particularly in the Global South. IFA will publish a study on this topic, how the pandemic leads to even more inequality and what culture can do against it. The study is realized by Christ de Vries, fellow of the London School of Economics and former member of the European Parliament. <coughs> um, so another topic I would certainly propose is um, culture and civil society. Politicians around the world have used the pandemic to legitimize autocratic measures in order to silence journalists, artists, and other independent voices. No fewer than 84 countries have enacted emergency laws. Newspapers have been banned, claiming that they might transmit the virus. Um, journalists have been arrested on charges of spreading disinformation. Um, the international climate of freedom of speech has really deteriorated. Um, we have already programmed dealing with these challenges on a national level. For example, IFA is not only providing research, but also practical help. We have a program dealing with temporary shelter to artists, academics, and journalists facing oppression. But what we need is closer cooperation 
on European level to enforce the civil society and civil society dialogue. And last but not least, the pandemic has led to both effects, solidarity and to nationalism. Europe has now the opportunity to overcome the crisis with a new approach. The cultural sector should help to de develop a European public space and develop models of cooperation and networking. The latest edition of the IFA publication Culture Report, Progress Europe, formerly published as UNIC Yearbook, is dealing with these challenges and how to combat disinformation with information. Among the authors, we have Federica Mogherini, Francis Fukuyama, Ilya Trojanov, Eva Menasse, Margaret Edward, and many more. Under the title, Reset Europe, Time for Culture to Give Europe a New Momentum. I think this sums up the situation, the situation rather well. You asked me about the um, International Culture Relief Fund. <coughs> the federal, the German as federal... As we're running out of time. Okay. So if we have time at the end, I, will, can, I can say a word on this, but I can uh, okay. Thank you for sharing uh, these insights from uh, IFA's point of view. Interesting to hear about the forthcoming study on how the pandemic increases equality. Um, let's move on to uh, Bulgaria. UNIC is also active inside the EU. Um, Lubov, can you tell us briefly about the evidence you've gathered, gathered on how the crisis has affected the sector in Bulgaria? And what is UNIC and European actors, what are they doing to offer the effects and move forward? And maybe you can also touch upon a bit on what our work is like within the EU. Thank you, Gita, and thank you to all the very interesting talks I've been listening in, and so many of, my, of what I have to say will resonate with others' views. Um, when on the 8th of March, uh, the first COVID cases were registered in Bulgaria, the first ban was issued by the Minister, Ministry of Healthcare, uh, followed by a number of others. Um, and in that first ban, the first events and the first um, activities that fell prey to the pandemic were indeed cultural activities. At the time, the Sofia International Film Festival, one of the international 50 uh, film festivals of highest ranking, was just four days away from the launch of its 24th edition. It had over 170 featured uh, films featured in its program, uh, from countries all over the world. It had a plan for a number of scores of filmmakers from across the world that were brought by uh, European um, uh, partners, including UNIC member partners in Bulgaria. The full catalogue had already been printed and it was in distribution. Tickets were being sold already. 8th of March, galleries and community centers and theaters and museums and, and just about everything closed and all events were uh, canceled, including the Sofia Film Festival. The state of emergency in Bulgaria was then shortly uh, announced uh, after that on the 13th of March. It continued to 13th of May for two months with complete closure of public uh, activities. And that was followed by the what we call now the extraordinary anti-epidemic measures. This will continue for at least till the end of July. Um, museums, the current state of affairs is museums, galleries, and cinemas were only allowed to resume their activities in mid-May at the time with 30% at 30% capacities. Theaters could only uh, initially perform outdoors. It was quite a challenge how to bring about uh, audiences to their activities. Currently, after a change of uh, and a series of changes to the measures, um, cultural oper operators in Bulgaria can, in fact, um, operate at 50% capacity, but it is still not financially viable for them to do so. And believe me, I went to a theater performance uh, just last week, sitting with a mask inside the theater, created a problem, not for us, the audience, but for the actors on stage, because they could not see the reaction. But the economic blow to the cultural sector, both nationally and at municipal level, has been really, really uh, um, uh, heavy, and more so even for the uh, independent sector. Um, the funding for culture has never really been um, massive in Bulgaria. It is part of the, um, uh, the proportion to the national budget is not uh, as much as a 
cultural operators would like to see it, but COVID has opened the eyes to just how much of a deficit there still is to see and how vulnerable the sector is. Then the analy the, there was uh, in its um, analysis recently of the employability uh, in various uh, sectors, the Institute of Market Economics commented on just how vulnerable the sector of entertainment and culture really is and how big of a blow uh, it has taken. Overall, about 2.9 2 thousand people have been registered as unemployed from this sector uh, between March and May. And this uh, comprises about 5% of the employees of the sector, which is really, really massive. And it is further deepened, the crisis is further deepened by the fact that a number of uh, independent artists would not even be registered, eligible for registering at, as unemployed. Um, a different set of analysis by a group of independent um, cultural operators in Bulgaria demonstrated that self-estimated gaps in income that the cultural operators were already experiencing at the beginning of the lockdown in the beginning of March uh, through all the cancellations of events and were estimating what the what the amount of uh, economic losses would be by uh, six months into the uh, into um, uh, limited activity op uh, opportunities and what it would look like towards the end of the year. Uh, and the figure there is 40 million, which is really, really serious. Now, the response of the institutions began in April, based on the analysis of the uh, of the um, Institute for Market Economy. Uh, Sofia Municipality, first of all, um, announced that it will respect all grants that it had previously uh, approved in its various uh, culture funding mechanisms, uh, which was relief to uh, operators. And although they had to revamp and adapt their activities, they were at least secure that those would continue. A further action was taken by the municipality by setting aside uh, an additional fund that, as a matter of fact, came from the um, uh, fees of the city councillors themselves. Uh, so out of those uh, um, a fund, uh, out of that uh, uh, funding, uh, some 500,000, so half a million Bulgarian level were uh, then distributed in several um, pillars of support, initially starting with two pillars aimed at independent artists and at venue sustaining organizations with offices and venues, and then realized that a third pillar was needed uh, dedicated to organizations that would not have their own office, but would have an, uh, a team to sustain through the crisis. Ministry of uh, Culture, similarly, after our discussions with, um, with uh, uh, representatives of the sector and based on analysis uh, presented to them, were able to reorganize and to rejig some of their uh, funding plans to organize the so-called stipends for independent um, artists who would not, art, art operators and artists uh, who would not necessarily be related to any uh, organized activity and would be losing income due to inactivity. Um, also, uh, one of the good, uh, there are two good uh, pieces of news. Uh, obviously, there is a deficit of sufficient funding. To, yeah. Uh, keep in mind the time. So. Yes, uh, two minutes, how much? Uh, Mm -hmm. um, two pieces of good examples here. The agility of changing, and I think this is something we should be bringing across uh, more of these dialogues. Agility of changing plans as you go along. And um, uh, while there was never a dedicated funding uh, for, for uh, uh, visual arts uh, projects and for dance projects, this crisis has brought to uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Culture dedicating uh, funding, funding mechanisms for that as well. Now, how has UNIC and European uh, organizations supported this process through a, lo a, a long? I think that one of the most powerful um, mechanisms of support has been our open voice to continue making the case for culture and cultural relations. We continue to um, in in uh, the, the, the lockdown, we continue to expose uh, um, 
opportunities for international access to and actually increase access to international cultural uh, cultural artifacts or culture culture from all over the countries we, we represent bilaterally but also multilaterally we set up uh, dedicated small projects uh, in in a way that we could for example what europe day meant for artists across europe including in bulgaria set up dialogues but i think where we need to take this further is round tables or whatever shaped tables from across communities to discuss what has worked and what hasn't worked different approaches and making sure that culture is seen as not a good to have but as an absolute guarantee that um, societies will be bridged that that uh, what we have seen we have seen all along um, the thank deficits you. across thank you uh, but this is I believe this event will make the power of cultural relations ever more powerful and evident across so thank you so much thanks a lot for sharing your insights from Bulgaria um, Ulf um, What's the situation like in Ukraine? Maybe just very briefly, because we do, it's, it's a fact that um, this uh, crisis has had a global effect, but there's also the House of Europe project uh, going on in Ukraine, you funded, UNIC implemented, and you have developed some digital measures to uh, combat the crisis. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yes, um, thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. Uh, I would like to start by saying that for the last couple of years, actually, the cultural sector of Ukraine has seen some very positive developments. Most importantly, the state has acknowledged the importance of culture, first for the process of nation building and second for Ukraine's international relations and standing in the world. This has led to uh, increased funding of cultural activities and to the foundation of key institutions like the Ukrainian Institute and the Ukrainian Cultural Foundation. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that the cultural sector, even before the crisis, remained quite vulnerable and weak. Many structures are new, people who are in charge are uh, often inexperienced, cultural infrastructure and know-how know -how outside big cities remains weak. Now, when the crisis hit in March, it followed uh, well-known patterns. Uh, events were canceled, venues were closed, artists lost their source of income. The big difference uh, to most EU countries was that there was no safety net. Uh, there were no compensation payments for creative people. What's more, uh, in March, the precarious fiscal situation of the government led to massive budget cuts for the cultural sector. Uh, first, the government wanted to reduce the cultural budget to zero, and after hefty protests, uh, the, uh, the budgets for uh, institutions like the Ukrainian Institute were reduced by only 50%. Relief came only uh, a few days ago, actually, that's uh, latest news, when the government uh, finally announced a support package for the cultural sector. If this package is implemented, it should help improve the precarious situation of the cultural sector, at least in the short run. Now, how have EU cultural institutes and EU programs reacted to the crisis? I will not talk uh, too much about the individual unique cluster members because uh, um, individual cluster members, of course, um, uh, reacted very differently to the crisis depending on their programs and resources. Some have been largely hibernating, others have shifted at least parts of their programs to the digital sphere. What uh, is noteworthy, however, and very commendable is the reaction of House of Europe um, for those of you who are not familiar with House of Europe, House of Europe is a 13 million euro EU unique program for Ukraine that is implemented by a consortium that is led by Goethe Institute. The main purpose of House of Europe is to build capacities and to connect Ukraine to European and cultural and creative networks. So House of Europe came up with a so-called response package already in April that contains four key elements. A, an online university for professionals who work in the cultural and creative uh, industries. Second, infrastructure grants um, that are um, open for companies who want to invest in the infrastructure or who want, uh, in the case of NGOs, also uh, pay their salaries and rental fees. Third, digital cooperation grants. Ukrainian and European organizations 
get up to 25,000 euros for jointly developed digital cultural projects. A fourth, an online hackathon that was um, uh, carried out uh, at the end of April, an online event with more than uh, 1,100 participants who presented 190 project ideas and in the end seven projects um, um, were uh, selected and received grants of up to 25,000 euros. I would like to uh, make a very brief post-crisis outlook. What is the future? This is, of course, uh, difficult because we are still in the midst of the crisis. But I um, see already that we are ahead of a number of challenges and risks for the years to come. The first risk is uh, underfunding. The underfunding of culture in the coming years, um, as I said already, the fiscal situation of the state is not good. And the question is, of course, uh, will culture remain a priority under um, this situation of economic austerity? Second, and that's closely related, a possible loss of creative talent of artists, of cultural managers due to the poor economic conditions. Migration is a real topic in, uh, in Ukraine. Ukraine has already lost 20% of its population since independence. And a recent survey in Western parts of Ukraine uh, found out that 67% of the population consider um, migration an option. Um, um, the third uh, risk is the po a possible loss of potential partners, of course, for us, uh, partners that we need for the implementation of our programs. A fourth risk is the reduced sustainability of our own programs uh, because of the circumstances that I just explained. And the last but not least risk that I see is uh, the risk that our own cultural input in Ukraine will decrease because it is foreseeable that um, national EU member states um, and budgets for international cultural relations and corporations will be scaled back um, because of our necessity to reduce public debt after the COVID-19 crisis. Thank now, you very yeah. much. Uh, just a um, okay. Thanks for reminding us also of these um, budget cuts that you foresee um, uh, will, that will heavily affect um, our work in, in Ukraine. This also mirrors what we found out in our member survey. Um, now, just a reminder, there's the Q&A um, box uh, where you can put in questions uh, for the panelists. Also, dear panelists uh, who are in the room, if you could check, there's some I think that you can take in writing. Um, and you can also upvote questions that you find interesting that other people have asked. Now, Tamas, Tamas Suk, uh, joining us from DJ EAC, the cultural unit of the commission. What, how do you see your role in bringing all of this together now that we've heard these needs, the different actors already being active um, in the field as the um, commission? And how do you achieve synergies uh, with partners and other EU services on the implementation of cultural relations? Uh, thank you, Gita, for this uh, easy task to summarize what we have heard uh, a bit more seriously. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for the valuable and, and very interesting uh, interventions so far. I think it's very clear that uh, the crisis is showing us uh, that we need to reinforce the role of culture in fostering uh, international partnerships even more than before. I mean, that was stated clearly by Henriette and Oliver, and I fully agree with that. And basically all speakers on the ground with different argumentations. We all know that cultural cooperation uh, allows to fight against stereotypes, prejudices, nurtures dialogue, to seek solutions together. I mean, it all sounds a bit pompous, but it's very true and it's very relevant uh, under the current circumstances. And uh, one element which has not been mentioned so far, perhaps, is that uh, it could even strengthen our cooperation in other fields, such as research uh, and innovation, for mitigating the impact of climate change, and uh, most importantly, also to address mental health, as uh, Henrietta pointed out in, in her intervention. Another element which I see uh, clearly emerging uh, from the crisis is how much the cultural and creative sectors actually contribute to the economic and social development, uh, as well as to our own well-being. 
I mean, we knew also before, but I think the crisis has shown this uh, even stronger. Uh, of course, these sectors were drastically hit on all continents. Again, a very relevant point from uh, Henrietta, with which I fully agree. Never happened before and hopefully will never happen again. But we have to be prepared and there are good lessons to be drawn. Uh, we see that 95% uh, of these sectors consist of small enterprises, independent artists, freelancers, all highly vulnerable people. I mean, interesting interventions from Sri Lanka, going into the details also from, from Sudan, Ukraine, Bulgaria, perhaps to a lesser extent, or it's a different uh, dimension. But even in highly developed countries, I mean, uh, there is a significant uh, and, and very serious uh, situation. Uh, of course, we share the same struggle to help that the voice of the cultural sector is heard and that its value is recognized. This is precisely why the Commission has already taken a wide range of measures at EU level to complement the various national and, and local themes to alleviate the impact of the pandemic. I must emphasize to complement, because as you all know, culture is uh, basically a national uh, prerogative. Uh, but we are doing a lot and we will try to do uh, even more. Uh, it was indeed done with a lightning speed compared at least to the normal commission life and normal institutional life. Uh, hopefully this speed can be uh, retained. Uh, I must also uh, mention in this circle, of course, it's not without a cost uh, because it's, it's an immensely difficult job uh, for us uh, to carry out. I mean, in the institutions, all online, etc. Et so I'm very uh, happy that there is a positive uh, repercussion. It's a good acknowledgement of, of all the work which uh, has been put uh, into this. Uh, now, the economic recovery plan, which has already been mentioned, of course, is a comprehensive uh, uh, response to help Europe get back to on its feet. But it could also benefit uh, the cultural and creative sectors by offering additional opportunities for uh, funding culture outside creative Europe, if member states decide so. Very important, the if. We cannot force the member states to do that, but they have this potential. And uh, you may know that culture is mentioned among the 14 sectors which require special attention. And there are several <clears throat> initiatives uh, which aim to use this possibility. Such additional support could be available indeed from a wide range of programs uh, and funds like the REACT EU, the new cohesion policy framework, Invest EU, Digital Europe, uh, etc. I mean, to make just a few. Now, regarding Creative Europe itself, uh, we adopted uh, a maximum flexibility uh, measures, accelerated uh, many projects, published a new support scheme of 2.5 million for performing arts. In addition, uh, we are preparing uh, a special call for projects under Erasmus Plus in the range of 100 million euro, which is quite, quite an amount, especially concerning uh, Creative Europe. Uh, to increase cooperation and skills development between uh, organizations in the fields of education, uh, training, youth, and the cultural and creative sectors. This is an innovation and hopefully uh, will be on the ground uh, fairly soon. Thank of you, course, the... um, Tamas. Um, Sorry? Thank you. If you could have wrap, wrap up within a minute. Uh, I will try to wrap up. Uh, of course, the Future Creative Europe program will remain the only exclusive support, uh, as has always been. Uh, there are calls for a much larger increase, which are absolutely justified. But it's important to see that the latest MFF proposal already represents an increase of 8% compared to the last uh, period. But of course, very happy to see, to hear Sebastian concerning the German uh, position uh, on, on funding and <clears throat> there are strong calls uh, for this. Uh, we will see over the weekend where we will end up uh, eventually. 
uh, and I would also encourage all of you to address uh, all levels that are within your reach uh, to speak up. Yeah. There are a large number of other uh, issues I wanted to mention, in particular thanking UNIC uh, <laughs> for its contribution, the statement, and uh, your participation at the Creative Europe uh, conference, uh, etc. But I, I will skip that part of my speech. So just to reassure you that we are very happy to, uh, to work with you, and especially on this uh, European House and Spaces uh, project, which which is indeed uh, one of our key projects uh, in, in this domain and was happy to hear the positive feedback from people on the ground who are actually working on this. Thank you. Um, it's very um, good to, that you reminded us that we also need to do our advocacy in member states mm -hmm. because as we can maybe now see the results of our poll, uh, there is a summit uh, coming up this week actually and most of you were right. Um, where you know the future budget of the EU will be discussed and uh, the situation doesn't look all too good for culture and creative Europe and Erasmus so um, I think we need to we're doing this also by this meeting um, underline we are all convinced but convince more people that culture is important um, I do um, see some questions in the um, in the Q&A and, &A. and um, we are a bit late, so I would at least ask you to stay in the room for another 15 minutes so we can deal with these questions. One question has received seven votes and it comes from the University of Siena. It's to you, Oliver. Um, and I will read it to you. Um, and I see you already unmuted. So in case of the EAS, how do you ensure there is enough human resources in the headquarters and within the EU delegations to deal directly or indirectly with culture and cultural relations. So how do you ensure resources, human resources for culture? Okay, thanks a lot. And thanks, by the way, also for all the other uh, interventions. It's really helpful in uh, this exercise that uh, I mentioned we are conducting to, uh, let's say, uh, review the, the strategy. And that's also uh, the um, massive uh, principal part of the answer uh, to the resource question. We need to know what uh, we're aiming at. We need to get the political uh, buy-in, which I'm very confident we, we get, uh, if we get more concrete um, with uh, this, uh, let's say, review of a, of a strategy that is, uh, has its four years uh, for which conclusions have been adopted at ministerial level two years ago, where implementation has uh, progressed, but where it's also, I think, clear, even without uh, the current uh, crisis, that, uh, as is, by the way, normal for, for all our uh, strategies, that a review is uh, is timely, and COVID, of course, makes that uh, point even more, more clearly. So um, we are trying to uh, advance with that fairly fairly quickly. Still before the summer break, there should be a senior senior level meeting here in the ES uh, to to see what kind of new priorities we could develop, uh, what uh, how we could bring in the delegations uh, even further. I mean, we uh, you all know it. They uh, they have of course always been open for business. They are our principal. Uh, uh, let's say antennas in this, and um, have of course already uh, sort of focal points and on some um, some resources. We also have, when we look at cultural diplomacy as as part of also wider public diplomacy effort, uh, also of late uh, increased those those resources further. And we're also in good discussions with um, with the uh, with one of the other member states uh, helping us or ready to help us. But it all it all uh, depends on on the let's say uh, strategic direction that we can take the political buy in and then the, the resources will uh, hopefully hopefully follow. Um, again, uh, as was mentioned uh, pre previously also by, by others, I mean, the resource issue is, of course, a critical one. We need to, uh, I think, be uh, also creative in a sense that the culture or cultural relations, cultural diplomacy stand alone will always be a bit more, um, let's say, difficult to uh, sell as if it was, uh, let's say, embed embedded in what we're doing in, in the various policy fields. I mean, digital has been uh, has been uh, mentioned. There is uh, quite a series of bilateral, um, let's say, partnerships that are being uh, intensified developed. A very important one being Africa, where we have a, a summit planned for later this year, where again, it's in all our interest to 
sort of uh, streamline and and bring in um, or mainstream rather this this cultural diplomacy uh, issue also in that kind of relations because that will help us to draw also on uh, on other resources that are not specifically earmarked for for cultural diplomacy. But uh, the the long and short of the answer is we're currently in a process uh, of of reviewing um, what what uh, adjustments are needed, uh, new ideas, new initiatives potentially and then the resources will follow follow from there but i'm uh, optimistic in that respect over thank you uh, very much um probably some colleagues will have to leave at uh, 1 30. um there's a question about advocacy for culture also in relation to tourism because the, the colleague says uh, this is papasso um that often there's too much influence on or the discussion is turning around uh, of, of uh, politicians, politicians and stakeholders see tourism as the main, if not only reason to justify culture. And it's difficult to change their minds. So any ideas how we can strengthen advocacy for culture also in relation to tourism? I thought maybe Tamas or Henriette, that could be something you might want to take. Uh, yes, perhaps uh, I, I could start because I have to leave in one and a half minute for another meeting, sorry. so. So, and Henrietta could surely uh, complete. Uh, we have uh, indeed uh, a new uh, strategy being developed primarily by Commissioner Breton, and we are working uh, with uh, his team to emphasize the cultural aspect and to draw attention uh, to this field. Uh, before I, I leave this uh, forum, I wanted to point out one issue which uh, may be important for, for all of us and relates also to the funding that uh, here in EAC, of course, we are very happy to join forces uh, with the RELAX family uh, and with colleagues in the other institutions to make sure that uh, culture and international cultural relations become an internal part of the new funding instruments which are being prepared for the next MFF. I think that this could put the whole cooperation on, on a new ground if, if we have uh, a good planning ahead for the next seven years and we have a, a more structured uh, cooperation uh, than before. Thank you. Thanks, Tamas, and, and thank you for joining us. Thank Henrietta, you. would you like to have the floor? You need to unmute yourself at this point. Yeah. Okay, so um, I see this time and again that culture is seen only in its value of uh, uh, where it adds to the money machine. And this is of course part of our capitalist system, unfortunately. And, uh, but we, that's what we have and we have to work with it so uh, what we have tried in DEFCO is to underline the potential for job creation. So, um, of course, uh, finance ministers and others in the government, they link it to tourism. So um, this is increasing the attractiveness of the country. But I have to say that this is only a long-term process that, that takes years to change the mindsets of people. And I think with cultural production ourselves, we can, um, we can achieve that. For example, in the Ivory Coast, we had a very uh, interesting experiment using culture to change uh, mindsets. Um, on all types of, uh, on all types of, uh, um, let's say, different social prejudices, not only uh, regarding culture, but also an SIHR and uh, inequality. And it was uh, known musicians, artists, sports stars, so culture in the wide sense, that were, um, performing, but also giving workshops and, and briefings uh, all over the country. And they took a big bus and they put everybody on the bus and wherever they went through the whole country and wherever they went, they drew tens of thousands of participants. 
So um, I think maybe there, in order to change mindsets, we have to think a bit out of the box. And in the meantime, in order to uh, convince the diehards, I think we have to continue the, the argument of the job creation. And that is really linked to, um, to tourism. So um, I don't see it as a big problem, uh, except that, of course, it points to, uh, to the large prejudice that we're still facing um, when it comes to culture. Over. Thank you. <laughs> um, I do want to now turn to um, Natasha and, uh, and Randa. There's a question about more insight into the music sector, if you could point a colleague from the International Music Council to the right source. Maybe Natasha, if you want to start. Um, thank you for the question. Um, as a festival, uh, we are engaged with uh, Sri Lankan and diaspora Sri Lankan musicians, especially um, also spoken word poets, etc. We are working with more and more. Uh, I have to say we do not have a comprehensive data report that we can share at this point. Um, but also the unique cluster Sri Lanka, especially the Goethe Institute, has been working uh, with a wide range of mus musicians and they would be equipped to uh, at least share uh, information with you of this uh, from this particular moment and its impact as well as uh, certain policies and programming that have been made. Randa, um, as a director also of a music festival, I'm sure you have something to add here. Uh, yeah, um, actually uh, our festival that has been running for six years now and uh, we did a lot of uh, trainings and uh, a lot of programs uh, going towards uh, developing the musician and music sector. Uh, unfortunately, after the, the new situation of coronavirus, we had to cancel uh, the fund for this year festival, uh, but keeping at the same time the EU fund to continue with our uh, training online uh, because we have uh, the festival part and we have also the training part. So at least we are keeping the training and developing uh, capacity building uh, part uh, online uh, because of uh, you know uh, limitation of travel and things like that. Uh, the music sector, like uh, other cultural sector, they are of course uh, uh, suffering from uh, lack of fund, lack of connectivity, uh, because it reflects uh, the, the whole situation of the country, uh, lack of uh, resources, so uh, they are not disconnected. So if the whole situation is, is, is lacking, so of course they also lack, but we are hoping through our festival and EU uh, contribution to support this sector um, is going well. Uh, now uh, uh, we are in uh, the process of uh, developing a music academy uh, with uh, one of the partner in Germany, and this is this gives a big hope uh, in this line for for musicians and uh, people working in the music industry as well. Thank you. I see a couple of questions that uh, circle around the topic of uh, resilience and the cultural sector. Um, but before that, I want to um, I think this is Oliver who has mentioned the virtual Erasmus. There's a question by Susanna Kozlowska. What would virtual Erasmus look like? That is for me. Um, yeah. The but, yeah, no, it does. Yeah, if I can. <coughs> sorry, on the um, Erasmus Plus. I mean, it is already uh, uh, something that does exist. It's a virtual exchange platform. I mean, <coughs> sorry, also providing intercultural learning experience, so to speak, and that has been created uh, for let's say also reasons that can can be of uh, relevance now namely that the, the actual erasmus uh, involves uh, traveling in the first place uh, sort of mobility uh, which is now a bit uh, hampered but also at some point even is, is of course restricted uh, there's a resource issue here um, maybe it's also sort of favoring those that are already uh, better off in in their respective uh, societies so 
taking taking uh, let's say various elements together including the technological uh, abilities that uh, that have been or capabilities that have been improved and the need uh, and the ability to connect also on a, on a global dimension we have had um, already uh, some uh, some cases and this has been launched by the way in 2018 um the uh, piloting so to speak approaches to to a virtual exchange uh, mainly in the first uh, phase to also complement uh, the physical ones because ultimately we all in agreement they need to uh, as, uh, if at all possible uh, continue but uh, now we could even think about uh, you know um them them uh, facilitating further training uh, and and uh, also using them in a more sustainable way so uh, there is there is already and i'm not sure uh, or, or could imagine that uh, colleagues uh, Eak, uh, and Def, uh, could, could could or would complement but as such that's in a nutshell what this is what this is about and it looks to me as something that becomes even more relevant in the in the current circumstances yeah. over from for me thanks um Henriette, did you want to take this as well yeah yeah um i mean uh to have a, a virtual Erasmus Plus component has already been in the planning to have that strongly reinforced in the new uh, program. But now with COVID, of course, this becomes even more relevant. And what we were thinking is that the majority of uh, universities now develop online content some of them have the whole uh, uh, the whole program their whole semester online so there is no need really to be physically present this is not supposed to replace erasmus but it's supposed to make massively available content of the highest academic quality to wherever you are so uh, what if you couple it with digitalization it has enormous transformative um, cap, uh, potential because with erasmus plus each scholarship is costing a lot of money but if you complement it by virtual content you can reach really hundreds of thousands of students all over the world give them access to first class uh, academic and uh, also vocational training because we want to to um, to have this expanded to vocational and we have also fought to have a special window for cultural operator exchanges um, now there is a little bit of a discussion on how far you go into side areas like vocational training and special windows for special groups and for not diluting the principal purpose of Erasmus Plus. But uh, certainly you will see that the new Erasmus will have a very strong virtual component. Over. Thanks. Um... There's also uh, Kimani Njogu from Kenya is asking, when we talk about resilience, um, are we thinking also about the resilience of the artists and cultural experts uh, themselves? Very important reminder. Also, I would like to add to the digital components that we also need to make sure not, not to leave people behind. As we all know, on the worldwide scale, access to digital means is not equally spread. Um, but as Kimani was also asking about studies that focus on as such, um, yeah, the, proving the resilience of artists. Um, I would like to come back to Sebastian because there was also a question that asked about more info about this study that you mentioned on the effects of the pandemic. And maybe you also know about other studies that could be relevant for the questions that have been asked here. We cannot hear you. Um, you would need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Just in the, this moment, I sent my answer by via, via the chat as well. So the uh, the report called uh, Reset Europe can be downloaded on already on the IFA website. It is available in German and in English. And the study I mentioned, which is which is realized realized by Heist de Fries, will be probably published in in late summer. That's to say in September. 
and when it will, it's, it's going to be published, of course, you will find it on the website as well. And uh, as I already mentioned, the study is about culture and the development goals, social social development goals. And um, of course, um, this is linked to the joint communication, as uh, Oliver mentioned it. And it's, a, it's absolutely about supporting culture as an engine for sustainable development. So this is the topic of the of, of the study, and we also learn about very interesting facts and how uh, the culture industry, how the cultural sector is, is is hit by by the COVID pandemic. So it's interesting also to to read statistic material in this study. Thank you. There are a number of uh, questions still um, in the Q and A. Um, maybe the panelists can have another look to see if they can reply to one in writing. I would now like to wrap up this meeting. Uh, we said we would finish at 1.30, now it's 1.43. I would like to give the floor to Roberto Vellano, uh, the UNIC president, for a final summary. Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Git. A quick word on my side. Lunchtime is, is fast approaching at least in, in Central Europe. Um, more than uh, summarize, I will uh, just uh, say, well, first, thank you to all the participants for this uh, very enriching debate. Uh, um, often we take for granted that culture exists uh, and we are often ready to accept uh, budget cuts uh, as we are witnessing uh, in these days in, in a difficult debate on the EU budget, thinking that when there is a crisis, uh, cultural education uh, is a luxury item that we can do without uh, if more urgent problems arise. But we know that this is a mistake, not only because culture represents uh, an important economic component of our society, not only because, uh, as we said, uh, the role of culture to help mental health and psychological resilience is important, but maybe most important because uh, there is a, a profound identity, uh, common identity between uh, culture and politics. If we need uh, an evidence for that, we can we don't need to go far. We, we can just look at in the recent days uh, at the controversy about the status of uh, the, the church or mosque or museum of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It is essentially a, a sensitive political problem. At the same time, it is a problem related to cultural policy, to the management of cultural heritage, to, to the role of UNESCO, etc. This is a typical example, not necessarily a positive one of how politics and culture often overlap and in fact show their profound common identity. Thank you all for uh, this uh, debate. Over to Gitte. Thank you very much, Roberto. Before we um, finally uh, close this meeting, we've, we will be launching another poll because um, as this is the sixth in a series of unique talks, we were thinking about some further topics and would like your opinion. Um, of those, I think this is, you can choose one topic that you would think would be important. Um, I would like to use the opportunity also again from my side to thank all the panelists who have joined us today and enriched our debate on the future of cultural relations. Um, we will prepare a short report which will be published on our website. We can, you can also download the recording there um, in a couple of days or shortly. And I would like to take this opportunity also to thank the UNIC Global team who in the background have been making sure that people are ushered in and out of the rooms and that everything works. So that's Roxanne Schava, Sibylla Britani, Giacomo Corangiu and the Master of Ceremony, Robert Kieft. Thanks a lot. Thank you to all the attendees and maybe we can already share the results of our quick survey. All right, digital is and European Green Deal, peace building. Okay, that's great. Thank you for this. We will take this to our hearts and see what we can come up with for a follow-up debate. And uh, that's it. That's then also a big, another big thank you from my side and over and out. <laughs>